Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today at the AI and Women in Tech seminar organized by SHE at Singapore Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. What happens now? Please note that this webinar will be recorded for, for quality control purposes. I would now like to introduce Ms. Shobha Bhalla, my fellow Sikhi board director and the chairperson of She at Sikhi. Ms. Shobha Bhalla is a well-known award-winning journalist who has extensive experience in both print and online journalism. Ms. Shobha founded India Say Media in 2007, which is the first media company serving the Indian diaspora in Southeast Asia. Without further ado, I will now hand over the proceedings to her so that she can deliver her opening statement. Over to you, Shobha. Thank you, Purnima. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the third Women in Tech webinar organized by Shiat Siki, as Purnima has told you. We are the women's wing of the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Artificial intelligence will reshape every aspect of our lives in the future, from education to defense, from healthcare to government and finance. But it's disquieting to know that those building this technology don't fully represent the society they are poised to transform. The field of artificial intelligence is far too male dominated. According to a 2018 study, just 12% of AI researchers globally are female. Yet there are many brilliant women at the forefront of AI today, as we can see from our panel of speakers today, two of whom are in cutting edge AI engineering, Dr. Ramaswamy Savita and Ms. Swati Joshi. Our technology is not independent of human values. It represents the values of the humans that are behind the design, development and application of the technology. So if we are worried about rogue robots, killer robots and the like, we should really be worried about the creators of the technology, not the technology itself. We want the creators of this technology to represent our values, our shared humanity. This is where the scarcity of women among machine learning researchers comes in. This also leads us to the abysmally low number of women-led startups receiving VC funding. Research has shown that only one to 2% of the startups that receive VC funding are led by female founders even though female-led companies make 200% returns on investment. In addition, research has shown that men are promoted for their potential, while women are promoted for their achievements, means they have to prove. Men don't have to. You can use your imagination how well they're going to do. VC investment is all about betting on the potential of the founder. This is the most gender biased segment in the tech industry. As more male-led companies are funded, there are more success stories among them and the more VCs choose to fund male-led companies. Then there is popular media, TV shows and movies perpetuate the boy genus, the wonder kind image with their portrayals of male tech titans. The superstars of tech are all males, further reinforcing stereotypes. So that's how gender roles are reinforced and the representation of women continues to decrease. It becomes a vicious, exclusive circle of males and women in AI become fewer. To create a gender equal world of AI, we need conscientious work from the AI research community to recruit and promote more female talent. We need to find technical solutions for fair and accountable AI. Investors need to support more female founders and we need to create more images of AI and robots free of gender stereotypes in the media. 
Let me now introduce you to our moderator, Yelena Ganshov van der Meers. As a founder of Brand Boosting Agency, Yelena is an expert in media production and visual marketing. Through her work, she helps companies gain visibility from customers, partners, and potential investors. As a creative mind, Ms. Yelena has embraced technology to bring storytelling, content marketing, and innovative solutions to businesses. She also produces and hosts Inside Tomorrow Innovation and Technology, a talk show based in Geneva, which discusses innovative tech trends in artificial intelligence, blockchain, robotics, virtual reality, space technology, and much more. She emphasizes the art of articulation and presentation, which is essential in the fast-paced digital world today. Yelena's rich international career spans an impressive range of disciplines, from the financial and diplomacy sectors to branding and media production. She has over 25 years experience living and working in the USA, Russia, Singapore, our own Singapore, and Switzerland. Yelena also has a degree in international economic relations from Russia. She's a Russian originally and a master's degree in economics from the US. Over to you, Yelena. Thank you, Shopa, um, for this kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Paul Johnson. He is a CEO of uh, the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. For reaching me out here in Geneva, he found me. I know we've been connected for some time um, since I lived in Singapore for almost a decade. And in the cold days in Switzerland, I think that I miss Singapore <laughs> and uh, beautiful weather and just you have a feeling of like always living in a, in a resort. This is what Singapore is about. Oh, Singapore is a big tech hub. And as a producer and host of Inside Tomorrow, um, my guests uh, are engineers, uh, innovators, policy makers in tech uh, sectors. And I think that a few times I had comments that there are quite a few men on your show. <laughs> and I said, Yes, it is a male dominated industry. And I would love to have more women on my show. This is true. And today I'm very happy to have all these beautiful panelists, all the powerful women who are working in tech and with tech. So in the question, the main question that I would like to cover today is uh, which role today, currently, women have in uh, decision-making in policy making, when approving technical designs, when creating um, policy guidelines for artificial intelligence, uh, big data security and privacy. This is a, a key, key point. So that, let me introduce our beautiful panelists um, who are here on board. Um, we have Anoprita Pomic. Anuprita, hi Anuprita. Anuprita has been working, I think, for the big world tech companies, uh, including Intel, Apple, Hewlett Packard, Yahoo, Dell, Google. Uh, she is currently uh, head of customer experience department for Google devices and services for Asia Pacific, and she has some over inspiring stories of opening an Apple office in Mumbai. Um, then she has a story of um, uh, looking for a marketing agency for Intel in Karachi. Uh, she was teaching previously, very recently at the university. Uh, she's constantly learning and receiving new certificates in artificial intelligence, blockchain. And I think that from her story, I remember she mentioned how she really had to fight for her first sales position in tech. And since then, she never looked for a job because all the jobs found her. Thank you, Anuprita, for coming today and being on the panel. Thank you so much for your uh, kind words, Selena. <laughs> um, another panelist we have is Dr. Jacqueline Lee. And Jacqueline is a Chief Human Resources Officer of Singapore University of Technology and Design. She is in charge of hiring the top minds in academics, uh, professors, researchers, 
all those who will then raise and shape a new generation of um, tech engineers, designers, scientists, those who will probably going to come and join big tech companies such as Apple, uh, Google, um, and those who probably will create, I'm sure, will create and build new tech unicorns. Thank you, Jacqueline. I, I want to see her to wake her. She, she is somewhere on the panel, right? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, hi, hi, Jacqueline. Hi. We also have Dr. Savita Ramazami. And Savita is a deep core artificial intelligence engineer who enjoys, she says, she enjoys developing algorithms working uh, for the Institute of Infocom Research. And Infocom Research is a part of the whole umbrella of ASTAR, Agency for Science, Technology, and Research. Savita is uh, leading a team of AI engineers working on multiple uh, projects in space of public health and recently providing predictive maintenance solutions for Singapore Airlines to ensure a seamless aircraft schedule that we all look for to continue or start again, flying again. I love Singapore Airlines. I think it's a top airline in the world. Uh, and we also have Ms. Swati Joshi. Swati, she's here somewhere, yeah. Swati is a principal data strategist at Singapore Airlines, working with adoption of artificial intelligence and analytics to constantly improve operations and constantly improve uh, customer experience. Swati has been selected as one of 100 women in tech in Singapore for 2020. No wonder Singapore Airlines is the top world airlines because they hire the best talent. Thank Swati, you. are you here? Thank you, Elena, for the introduction and thanks for having me. So the main question we have is what kind of role women have today in creating policy in AI applications, in adopting designs in technical um, fields? What is your experience? And I would like to uh, first, uh, I think that um, give the floor to Anna Prita because she worked uh, across the board of all the tech companies. She has such an amazing experience. Anna Prita, your, your, your stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in my opinion, the role of women across the tech industry is to lean in and you know make yourself heard because we have such a huge responsibility to all the users of AI. And many times users are knowingly or unknowingly using AI just because they are so wedded to their smartphones and there's a lot of artificial intelligence which goes behind all the applications that we use, et cetera. And as you rightly said, um, and, and so did Shoba, a lot of the people who are writing those programs or those applications are men. Mm -hmm. and We need to increase female representation. So I feel that, that our role of the people who are there and you know, can make decisions and policy changes or can influence policy changes, we need to not be silent. So there's a very, we need to step in. very important, don't be silent. Very, very important for all of the women who are already there to raise your voice and not be silent and also make sure that you bring other women along, encourage your girls and other girls that, that you have influence over to, uh, to participate. Yes. And this is experience from me uh, working with speakers who speak for their companies, um, explaining what kind of technology they have. And my experience when I uh, propose um, this kind of interview to men, they will say, when? And when I will speak to women, they will say, oh, let me think about it, I'm not sure. So this kind of hesitation or mm, women, they'd like to say in the shadow or they push, they're pushed in the shadow. So that's, that's how I feel. I think I, I to fully believe that they need to kind of encourage themselves to step in and raise their voice. 
Swati, what do you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what you and Anuprita have been saying that uh, as women, uh, it's not easy for us, but we have to make our voices heard. We have to speak up when we have a point of view. And uh, uh, especially like in the tech world where if you look across the board, there are more men than women across all levels of tech. Um, the, the responsibility lies with the few who are already there to be good role models for young girls, for, for, for women who are just stepping into work, for women or for girls who are studying STEM uh, technology, uh, to see these role models and, and, and think about the possibilities that lie ahead of them. Uh, would um, Savita add uh, something here? Um, yeah, so uh, AI by itself, right, is not independent of the human values. It I mean, it's, it's influenced by the values of the person who creates it, who designs it. And AI is powered by data, literally powered by data. And uh, there has to be a fair representation of data for AI systems to be effective to represent the diverse popul human population. So in terms of design, this is how it has to be done like there has to be large data collection including a women population and uh, largely most of the data that are collected up to date uh, i mean are, are last are, are largely biased towards the other uh, segment of the population so there has to be a fair representation there itself mm -hmm. because you work uh Savita works in really deep core engineering how yes. much of your female voice, um, do you think, how much of the influence you have on the team? Um, yeah, uh, I think as, as long as women are able to deliver uh, or able to, uh, you know, like uh, I, I would uh, quote Shoba here, we have to, you know, we have to show an outcome. It's not about the potential, it's about the outcome. Once there is an outcome, people are uh, more welcoming about our uh, and I think Anuprita's life by itself is an example to this. Her whole career journey you, is an example to this. So speaking of the percentage of women uh, represented in um, a deep uh, core engineering, what is the percentage, do you think? How many women on your team are there? Mm, so on a... In my team, um, you know, that there is a fair representation on both sides. Uh, I mean, there's a fair representation. But again, like Shobha mentioned, right, there's only 12% of women researchers in AI around the world. Um, yeah, and this is something that, that's a little, uh, you know, um, a little alarming uh, when, when we say 12%. Because um, uh, AI is... Like I said, it's powered by the people who design it. It, it carries the values of the people who design it. Um, take, for example, the automobile industry, right? It, it's largely been predominated by the uh, male population. And you see, and we see the effects of it. You know, even when it comes to crash tests, dummies are male dummies that's, that are being used. Yeah. So, so if, if this is the trend that has to be followed in the AI space as well, then that's something that we need to be concerned about. Well said. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline, now from the perspective of um, younger generation um, and the professors, researchers, the faculty, what's the representation and what kind of role women have in t at the university? So, um, you know, the Singapore University of Technology and Design was really set up in collaboration with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology 10 years ago to, to really challenge engineering norms in Singapore and in Asia. Uh, and, and one of the things that we did, uh, you know, was really aggressively to go out and uh, first recruit female faculty in deep engineering and AI. And second thing we did was really to bring up the percentage of uh, uh, ladies, you know, girls going into engineering. So for the students. last 10 years, yes, students. So the last 10 years, we have uh, actually have this um, uh, women in technology series that uh, we have come up with. And what we have effectively done, we've gone into all the schools and speak to 14 to 15 year old girls who are probably making a decision as to career paths, getting them to SUTD and have an entire day 
uh, of forums and uh, design workshops just led by female engineering faculty. Uh, and that has proven very effective, uh, the strategy of getting girls, you know, the, you know, to think about a career in engineering and in, 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 in AI. And we are really pleased to say that today we have 40% of our undergraduate students in engineering, which is an achievement. Yes. So as for female faculty, that is, of course, I think, um, Savita, I really fully agree with you. The deep tech is very challenging. When we first start, started our first computer science department, and we had zero female. Okay, to be frank, I couldn't find a female. But today, 10 years later, I'm proud to say that 15% of our deep uh, computer scientists working in areas of AI and deep tech are, are female. Okay, and, and they are all over the world. It's not just ASEAN, but from Europe, from the US. So that's an achievement. And in other areas of our uh, university in systems engineering, in product development, we have almost up to 30% of female. So um, that has been uh, very interesting for us. And I, I think you need to have a strategy to really focus and to do that in order to bring women into deep technology. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. So in the programs that you have, you say that you go to schools to encourage um, young girls um, to join the tech education. How exactly it happens? So uh, we will actually send out. Uh, we have you have to come up with a team. So the team is we, the team is women in technology, and we will show how sexy it is. So for example, nobody know that the first life raft was invented by a female. Uh, and the windshield wiper was invented by a female. So we highlight all the interesting things that female engineers have done throughout the last century. And that got the girls really excited, you know. So we start to, you know, why don't you come and our female faculty is going to talk to you. And when they come, we show them how, you know, I mean, AI by itself is not sexy, but you have to couple AI with design thinking. So how do you, how do you design, you know, uh, bring, you know, design things around using AI and also design thinking to invent products and services and systems for a better world. So we get the girls excited by, you know, introducing them to interesting teams like sustainability, product development for a better world. How do you, can you make a difference to the world through engineering? And that really appeals to the younger generation. I, I agree that giving examples of women, of, of the superheroes, as I said, will definitely encourage. And I wanted to point is that when computers came up and we had those big, big screens, there were lots of women working in this deep core engineering. It was considered to be kind of a routine job. And, and then somehow it moved into the male uh, positions and male functions as computer became smaller. <laughs> I think that uh, probably parents decided, oh, I will buy a computer for my son. Uh, oh, my daughter, will, she will be working in beauty or somewhere else in management and marketing and communication. Uh, and it became kind of a privilege of boys who will then go and study code and take the, the faculty in technology and design. Um, as you say, what's the percentage right now of uh, students at, um, at the university as women? For, you mean for the undergraduate studies? Yes. Uh, up to 40% uh, of our student population are female. Okay, because I remember Anuprita saying that when there were lots of positions at Google, there were very few applications from girls. Am I correct, Anuprita? Yes, that's right. As part of the, um, you know, Singapore, traineeship programs and um, at our Singapore site, you know, we have internships, etc. We find a lot of interns applying for various jobs. But when we look at the core engineering jobs, we find that the percentage of women is very low, almost non-existent. And, um, you know, that, that really hurts because, <laughs> because um, I've, I've actually gone and spoken to many young women. I have been teaching um, and I've spoken to them and they're like, are you sure I'll get in? I think it's too hard to get in. I'm like, you'll only find out if you try. Mm -hmm. And there was a question uh, that Vijaya was asking, Vijaya was asking, uh, which I answered. And she said, I'm, I have a lot of startup ideas, but I'm hesitant. And 
I, I just answered her, go for it. There's, there's no other way to find out whether your ideas are good or not. And if you don't put them into action, right? So, so do you believe there's kind of a lack of time for all those women who study now, as 40% are women, uh, study at university in uh, tech uh, professions and this is a big pool that will join soon on, I would say maybe two, three, five years or I, somehow women evaporate in a household or taking other, uh, other positions. Uh, I don't know where they evaporate, but in general, <laughs> women in tech and McKinsey has done a very detailed study uh, that, you know, even just at the first rung of management, right? So even if you have, um, a 40% women joining the workforce at the first level of management, there's a drop off, immediate drop off. So women don't perhaps put up their hand for more responsibility uh, or kind of help have that self doubt. Am I good enough? Actually, I think if I can come in here, Anuprita, I think it's basically the caregiving. I was recently at a Women's Day discussion. We were talking about the gender bias the care given always falls on the woman more, whether it's children or elderly in the family. And usually it starts happening from the 30s onwards, because in your 20s, you might not even be married. You know what I mean? So 30s upwards, especially the middle-aged women, that's where it hits them the most, because they have very elderly parents to care for, and they also have still going uh, school-going children. So this is where the huge imbalance and the biases occur. And talking about Google, I think a Wired magazine had once written not too long ago that out of 640 people listed working on machine intelligence, only 10% were women. Again, maybe it's all about like how Dr. Jacqueline B says they have to go. People haven't been going into schools to excite girls into taking up STEM subjects like this, especially deep core engineering, AI. AI is like, like I had said earlier, is the most, most biased, the greatest biases are in AI research. So I was just thinking perhaps, you know, it's not the women feeling shy so much as the women having other responsibilities too much to handle mm -hmm. at that particular time. That's why they fall off the radar. Yeah, that, that okay. could be true as well. To Dr. Savita's point, I just wanted to say, I think her point got a little lost with all of our enthusiasm, yes. but she said that, you know, the AI algorithms are only going to be as good as the data behind them. Absolutely. It is also a responsibility for us as participants. Whenever there's an opportunity for us to give our data, right, we shouldn't hesitate to give it because imagine if all the healthcare AI designed only around men's data and ignored women's data, and then we blame the algorithm when it's actually the lack of the data to train yes. those algorithms. Good so, point. Yeah. Excellent point. I would like yes. to add. Uh, my story just recently because we were looking for an electric car <laughs> and we were testing different electric cars i would name it to be politically correct uh but one of the cars we tested uh the acceleration was so fast so fast the same as was fast the braking system it was like oh very very abrupt so we tried to go like 200 uh kilometer per hour uh, very fast um also breaking extremely fast. In the end of the journey, my neck, I felt like this is not correct. Something is not good. And when I got out of the car, uh, I felt sick. I said, I feel kind of sick. It's just, it's kind of fun, but I don't feel good. And the first thing that came to my mind, I think that it's a bunch of boys who created this design <laughs> and they thought that this is really cool and we're going to race and we're going to play a rocket to space, um, but there was no woman on board in the design to say, guys, women now drive a lot and they drive children. And the first thing I'm thinking, my children gonna be sick in this kind of car. How far I'm gonna go in this car? And they're gonna say, okay, let me go. I'm gonna walk. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot handle anymore. So I think that in design, especially in automotive, 
I think it's so important to have women on board in improving designs and testing and trying. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. the women who, who do make it there need to speak up. <laughs> and, yes. and, you know, need to make sure that the data represents equal number of women uh, in, the, in the user data that you're using, right? Sure. Uh, I think that this yeah. is not a solved problem by just having more women there, but are those women making an impact where they are? True. And, and also, uh, I was surprised to uh, know that uh, the office, the, the temperature in the office environments, right? They are mostly the, the set temperature is, I mean, through research, the formula to set the temperature is based on the average male population and the uh, female population is largely ignored there. So this uh, overestimates the uh, hum uh, the women's uh, metabolic rate, and therefore it's like uh, five degrees, at least five degrees higher than what it should be for women. So, uh, so this this discomfort may lead to uh, you know unproductivity, and this this might uh, you know indirectly reflect on women not performing at par with men and so on. So, so this is something that's fundamentally flawed in, in terms of design and, uh, you know. Uh, yes, true. So one of the arguments I think that uh, especially men have uh, is uh, when building teams, and I think it's a good question to HR, in building teams, should the teams be gender and culture balanced or talent balanced? Um, I think, uh... In building teams, there are a lot of factors, you know, there are a lot of complexity in teams. It depends on what are the focus of the teams, you know. If you ask me, definitely, you know, um, I would say that you need a good mix of gender representation as well as the kind of skills and expertise, the breadth and depth of the expertise you need. But more so, so you kind of want to find teams that can work together. Teamwork is important. But in many of our teams here, uh, we in our project teams, I believe in ASTA, you have a lot of research project teams. Uh, we will bring in a good gender mix because uh, the women bring in a perspective that men do not bring in. You know, so definitely, uh, I would say that women has that added, added element on top of the hard core skills that we bring to the table as compared to men. Sorry, uh, Johnson, you're the only male here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I think definitely there must be that diversity, if you ask me. Uh, Swati? Yes, I mean, totally agree with everything Jacqueline is saying. And uh, just to add my two cents here, I think this is not a very black and white question. For me, if I was building a team, I would imagine that the primary focus is on having talent balance. Um, but having said that, if in a fair world, you know, you could find people who are, uh, you know, you could find people of each gender with different, uh, uh, with different backgrounds who are equally talented to do the job. So when you're trying to get a talent balanced team because you want to get the job done, if you find that you have ended up with a gender unbalanced team, I think it's a, then, it begs the question that should we look into our own prejudices and biases? Um, why have we chosen all male or all female teams to do this job? Uh, why could we not find a very talented team with all the skills needed to do that job, which was also gender balanced, which was also balanced on other diversity criteria? Because as, as many of you say, you know, having different backgrounds, a team of different backgrounds also helps with creativity and have, and they bring in different perspectives. So, uh, yeah, so for, for me, this is not, these two are not in conflict. They can go together hand in hand. Um, but yes, we want to get the job done. So we're focusing on talent, but that does not mean that we need to have a un gender unbalanced team. If, and the pretty is this, yeah. Yeah, if I could just add to what Swati and uh, Jacqueline have said, I really think that there is an opportunity over here to um, look for the people who think they can do that job or encourage more women to apply for those jobs, which they are a bit hesitant or reluctant to. And um, 
wherever possible, if you have to, like you have to get the job done, but you should be confident that by hiring a balanced team, even if, you know, you need to invest a little bit more in training those women or making them more confident of presenting their work to you, you still, again, as a woman, I feel a wholehearted responsibility to, to be able to do that, to over hire women, um, even if they are not meeting 100% of the skills, because I would do the same thing for a man. So why would I not do that for a woman? And, and you know, women need it more. Similarly, there are people with disabilities. Their disability may be that they are in a wheelchair, but their mind is working. So why would you not hire them? Why would you not give them that extra uh, to just give them a chance, right? Um, and, and that's where this whole question of equality versus equity comes in, right? Because equality is all about equal opportunities, but equity is about how do you give them an equal outcome, a shot at an outcome, right? And do you I, I also story. wonder, sorry, I also wonder, you know, you were talking about, uh, I wonder if it's also about confidence that women have in their own abilities. Because I remember uh, a few years ago, I read some research on when, uh, on how men and women, when they see a job opening, how do they react? So a man would look at a job and, you know, a job scope and say, I can do like five out of the 10 things I'm going to apply. And a woman is going to look at it and say, I can only do four, five out of the 10 things. Uh, maybe there's something, you know, I need to work harder. I won't apply. I'm not ready for it. Yeah, so that research it, actually said that even if the woman can do eight out of 10 things, she yeah. will not apply. She will, exactly. She do the two. Yeah, so are we holding ourselves back? Like, is it a question of, just, you know, how we see things, we want to be perfectionists. Um, and that's what is holding us back because we want to make sure that we can do everything right. Whereas men are very confident, they'll figure it out. They'll apply, they'll get the job and they'll figure out how to do it. Anupriya, do you have any story that you can share where there was maybe a situation in across all those different uh, big uh, companies where a woman made a difference solving a, a certain problem. I, um, I have this live example in my team where, you know, there is a woman who has been, so I look after customer experience um, at Google. And there was a woman who was in, been in sales management, and she was keen to come and work, take a short term assignment in uh, my team. And I was wondering, like, oh, you're coming from sales management, you've been at Google 14 years and you're a people manager, why do you want to take an individual contributor role on my team in customer experience? And then she started talking and I found out that she got her PhD whilst being a mom to two kids, PhD at Beijing University, no less. And uh, you know, she decided to uproot her comfortable life in Beijing to come to Singapore alone with her two kids because she thought the education system is much better and they can have more diversity, um, exposure to more diversity, et cetera. And her husband decided to stay back. So she's like literally managing these multiple fronts. And I was like, sold, right? <laughs> I must have you on my team. I am grateful. Here's a red carpet to, to get you in. Now, many times I find that people hesitate to, to hire trailblazers and think that, oh, but you don't have customer support experience, so I'm not going to hire you. And that's a pity, I think, because, you know, they bring, the people that you bring with the diversity of experience actually come with a fresh set of eyes and they can tell you things which you have not thought about. So it's not always about gender diversity, but I'm exposed to so many, many, many cases where I have connected fantastic people to hiring managers and they've looked at their CV and said, oh, but he or she doesn't have this or doesn't have that. So it should be experience diversity, gender diversity, culture diversity, everything that can bring also diversity in brainstorming, oh. in thinking and finding new solutions to problems. Mm, yes. Um, now I'd like to speak about uh, 
the life balance. Um, uh, looking back, the industrial revolution brought us washing machines, robots. I don't know anyone who has iRobot home. I have. <laughs> so it brought us, brought us machines because we um, women are very much multitasking. We have a job job, we have a house job, we have family job, mom job, those who have children. So we're constantly multitasking in our mind and uh, we need help, basically. So industrial revolution brought us this help. Now the digital revolution, technology revolution, brings us more applications, bring us a more opportunity as today we're here online on this video conference, answering questions and there are many people who are watching us today and will watch us after in the recording. So, but at the same time, technology uh, brings us this communication applications and uh, requests more time. We're often on our devices. It, we are often 24 seven. Does it bring us more responsibility than help? Does it really bring us that life balance? What do you think? Uh, maybe I'll attempt to answer that question. Uh, definitely with the permu permutation of technology infiltrating our lives, you know, uh, you know, um, you would think that sometimes technology is supposed to make our lives easier, but sometimes I think it's made our life a lot more complex, you know, because we are so, you know, um, always on the go 24 by 7. We are always digitally connected somehow. And because of the speed of digital transformation, I think we're all under con this constant pressure to always catch up and keep up. So I think as women, maybe also for men, I think there must be a time out. Uh, we must uh, be able to strike a balance as women. Uh, we have families. I, I come back home. Um, you know, uh, what I will do is I, I, I do it on purpose. Like from 7 to 10, I disconnect from all my handphone devices. I do not check my emails. I spend time with my, my, my family, my kids. I talk to my daughter. If she needs to talk to me, I'll put down my phone. I'll just look at her in the eye and just give her that attention. You know, then if I need to catch up on my work, I will set aside maybe after 10 when everybody settled down and I'll, I'll catch up on my work. That's how I did my PhD. You know, I would do it after the kids have gone to sleep and I'll start to write my research thesis, you know. So I think it's really uh, segmenting your, your time and really setting aside and putting the discipline to be able to kind of <laughs> draw a line, you know, <laughs> before it kind of eats you up, technology. Thank you. Ms. Chopra, do you have something to add from all your experience? Work-life balance. Um, well, actually, I think the digital economy doesn't give you very much life work-life balance, especially if you want to get on in the world in terms of promotions, corporate ranking and all that. Because let's face it, up to now, most corporations and companies are run by men. And uh, they don't have the same expectations of work-life balance that women have. They don't think I have to go back home and make dinner and look after the child, my, my child, and also ask my elderly mother what she needs. You know, so they know that most of it is left to the wife or to the woman of the house. So um, my experience has always been where I've had to take on most of the responsibilities of back home, as well as equal responsibilities, if not more, in the workplace and when i'm an entrepreneur so i worked even harder as an entrepreneur when i ran when i was when i'm running my own company but it probably wasn't any better when i was employed because i had to prove i felt i had to prove i was better than the guys at work to get anywhere i mean it's an inbuilt bias in men and in the corporate system everything is built to reward male the alpha male type of behavior and output also even the expectations of what should be your the best outputs are all done by males so i think uh, it's getting worse with this uh, work life balance and i think the only good one of the very good things about the pandemic 
that this lockdown has helped is it is showing corporations and uh, male employers that actually working from home is possible. And because I think women should be given that option, not only women, but men also. And I, I think from childhood, boys should be made aware that it has to be a balanced life at home and at work. You can't just be, you can't just expect your wife to be do, doing the cooking and the soft, the soft part of living. Women take on both the hard and soft. So I think women are generally giving far more when they go into the workplace, really. Work, women work harder. So I'm wondering whether there shouldn't be a better salary structure for women, meaning they start with more than men, 10% or 15% more than men right from the beginning. I mean, as an employer, I think that way because I've been through this whole turmoil, this whole challenge and this very long discussion, which has been over 25 or 30 years about working from home and having a balanced life. It's been going on forever, but nothing's happened. Why? Why do women forget this when they go, when they become CEOs? I wonder what Indra Nui has done. I mean, she became the CEO of Pepsi Cola, but I've hardly ever heard of her changing the life, the working life and the systems for women in the, in the corporate system that she entered as a man and performed as a man or better than it's men. An this is an excellent point that, yes, when women reach a certain position and they continue kind of say, competition with male, uh, and when they reach that position, they act like a man. You know why? They're bought in. They've been bought. They, there's too much to, uh, at stake for them to, to contest. So they don't. That's the thing. They're all opted. They co-opt them. And if you keep co-opting women like this, there's going to be no, no positive ending. Uh, do you think artificial intelligence, I think it's a question to probably Anoprita or our DIPCO engineers, do you think that artificial intelligence can bring women something more than maybe we didn't uh, expect or didn't see coming, but more opportunities? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I was talking to you earlier that YouTube by itself has created economic opportunity for women who would otherwise be um, you know, homemakers and not earning uh, any, any income by themselves. And now if I look at all the YouTube influencers, there are so many stay at home moms who are, um, you know, teaching makeup or teaching cooking and YouTube pays them, right? For the number of followers that they have, et cetera. And Fitness. Uh, companies, Fitness. companies pay them to be, um, you know, their influencers and, and, and do product placement in their tutorials and so on and so forth. So I think that, AI has also created fabulous uh, economic opportunity for everyone, and particularly because women have taken that caregiver role. They were they are the ones who have most benefited from uh, these kind of things, as well as what Shobha was saying that the pandemic has taught us that everybody can work from home and be equally productive, if not more productive, because now you don't have the famous mommy guilt that I'm not spending enough <laughs> time with my kids. You can actually schedule your calls, you know, take your kids to the play date and, you know, have a call and do, do like multitask that women are very, very good at. I also want to say that not all men um, are, are in, like sort of immune to women's uh, issues and problems as being primary caregivers in addition to doing uh, their work because, for example, Satya Nadella or Sundar Pichai, uh, these are shining examples of men who have um, preserved a culture in the company to be recognizing that um, people have a personal life as well and, and giving that space to be your, to bring your whole self at work. Like Satya in his book talks about his son, right? Who's in a wheelchair and uh, the sacrifices that he has had to make uh, and that he and his wife have had to make 
I think that showing that vulnerability and saying that, look, I could still become CEO despite all the challenges is, uh, is fantastic. And so we should also look at those male role models. Yeah, Savita, uh, from the perspective of a deep coin engineer who enjoys working with algorithm, creating algorithm, what AI brings into your life? What kind of balance or advantages? So, like, I mean, in, in my, if you're, if you're talking about my life, like, like you just now mentioned about the iRobo, right? It has made, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of household chores very easier and so on. Um, and uh, I would also like to add on here that um, recently, it's a recent trend that I see more and more men willing to give up their jobs to support women in the workforce and, uh, you know, enabling them to achieve better goal, their goals and so on to in their career progression and so on. And uh, also, right, one other thing that, um, that that's a major obstacle or a major hurdle for uh, women in getting into uh, in, in, into a top role is uh, the lack of uh, connections or lack, lack of network connections and so on. So talking about AI or technology, right? The recent, um, you know, the prevalence of social networks has made this connection very, very easier. So you can reach out to anyone on LinkedIn and, you know, to seek advice or to get connected. You could reach out to anyone on Twitter. You could just make a tweet and it goes, by, uh, you know, viral and so on. So these, these are the kind of stuff that has enabled women to, you know, go out and reach out to people to build their own connections, to build their networks and so on. So, yeah. Swati and Jacqueline, do you have something to uh, add here? I, think I just wanted to say that uh, my husband uh, left his job. He was a very senior corporate executive in an American uh, large automotive industry, uh, General Motors. He left his job 13 years ago to look after my autistic son. You know, so that's an example of someone who is not afraid, who is not threatened by his wife doing well. He says, go saw in your career, I've done my part you go ahead and you do it and you know I'll, I'll just take care of the family. So he took on the roles as a house husband, you know, he actually gave up everything to look after the, the kids, wow. you know. So that's an example of a man who's willing to step aside. Just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a good example of um, behind a successful woman is a man. Is a man. <laughs> Helping her, supporting her. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I think very good points by everyone. And uh, you know, uh, culturally, in most cultures, you know, the the there's a disproportionate amount of the caregiving and housekeeping responsibility that falls on women. And uh, what can AI or technology do for us? Like our panelists have already spoken about a number of issues and the support they need from the men in their lives. But I think there's also a lot of untapped opportunities that we may see coming our way. Uh, you know, the, the robot cleaners, you know, it's just, I think, the tip of the iceberg. But uh, in the very near future, you may see, you may start seeing a bit more innovation to help us um, manage our work, our, our, the work in our homes, the, the, you know, the house chores a bit better uh, with the help of AI, with IoT. You know, for example, you're running low on supplies. Um, can the system detect that and order the stuff for you? I mean, right now, I do, I do almost all of my shopping online. I don't have to go to a grocery store and everything gets delivered to my home. So that's, that's already like a huge improvement from say, even like five years ago, when I remember that, you know, we used to make like lists in the house and somebody would go and buy those things and come back. So that's like two hours of your life every week gone just in shopping. And now I just order and everything is at home. So we are already making progress. And I think there are a lot more innovations coming our way to help us balance our life. Now, I think what you were saying, Yelena, was about you know our life being more complex and a lot of social media. The time that I save from going to grocery shopping, so maybe I save two hours every 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 week. What did I do with my time? If I am actually spending it on you know social media, um, we have to we have to take that call. Like, did we spend our time, the time that we save by Probably. not? Yours. Are we spending it wisely? Are we taking care of ourselves? Are we spending it with those that we love? 
are we using it to relax or are we just using that to stress ourselves out even more i i totally agree with you that uh, i i think that this is space for education and time management in this fast moving world uh, fast pace because uh, how the business develops and how it runs it is much faster than it was 10 20 30 years ago generation of our parents and grandparents it's just we cannot even compare so we feel sometimes in this kind of race but what what is important is to give priorities of our time that we also need time to rest off screen eyes off screen we get tired our brains get tired and i from my personal experience i usually it takes me i tell myself just get off the screen get out get for a walk fresh refresh the brain and that's the moment when new ideas come up and you look at things and maybe problems or issues from a different perspective absolutely we need time away from the tech <coughs> actually make the best use of it so working we're all working uh, please and please yeah, i just wanted to say um you know this might seem like a quick product plug but in reality you can you can use google assistant right and have these small things like hey set an alarm or you know do uh, remind me about this or that like you don't even have to type anymore thanks to the uh, nlp it's so good it now understands our accents here in asia and as i was telling the women you know that that is only going to get better if you use it right it's going to get better at recognizing you and your voice if you use it so you should absolutely use all those um voice assisted technologies wherever you can as well as when you have email smart compose you know it's going to get better and better if you actually use it like what would a man say as in response to a question sure what would a woman say yes i would like to do this but now if you click on sure then yeah you're responding like a man but if you want the ai to learn that no none of those three responses are what i would say here i'm going to type my own then that's how the algorithm is going to learn to be better at modeling and then therefore helping your productivity Thank you, Anna Krita. Can, can I just say something? It sounds a lot like Brave New World, like a bit scary too. After some time, we don't use our fingers. After several, several thousands of years, we'll have no fingers left. It's like what he predicted, Aldous Huxley. If we don't walk, we'll soon have no bipeds. We won't be bipeds anymore. We'll just have little toes sticking out or something. So, I mean, there are some things shouldn't we always rely on our own instincts and ourselves? it can only go so far all this ai because it shouldn't be allowed to take over entirely our lives even the little things that are so feminine and so instinct or so male instinctively done you know like i totally agree i think that's perfect that's a perfect example of where it's your choice how much you want to use or stay away from but uh, but yeah it's a personal choice that we have to make and and similarly right like the ai some people don't like to have those smart watches and but has it saved lives sure it has right the people who uh, do keep a track of their health and fitness through these apps and smart watches etc uh the bottom line here and i think that uh, savachi made an excellent point is that uh, for ai work also and bring advantages to us to women we need to participate more in design teams in testing and bring this data for ai what we need as women what we want to uh, as women what we're expecting and as uh, i mentioned that uh, now all this communication requires a lot of time it's for us to learn how we use this time properly and how we we learn we constantly learn with the technology how we balance our own lives so i would like if there is anyone to, who would like to add something i would like to start closing this uh panel discussion 
and thank everyone, all the beautiful, powerful women here today. And I encourage those uh, people uh, who are watching us to connect with you on LinkedIn, on other social media, if they have maybe direct uh, message questions to you, I would like to encourage them. Do not hesitate, step in, raise your voice and ask. Thank you. Really impressive panel we've had this time, honestly. I think it's the first time we've had deep core engineers and we've got um, someone like Anuprita who's been in every big tech company, you name it, and also been an entrepreneur herself. So then we have Dr. Jacqueline Lee, uh, you know, working as head of HR. Interesting thing she told us about those little girls being inducted into science or being given this chance to be interested in science. That's interesting. I wonder if all the universities do that in Singapore. Yeah, Shobha, I'll go ahead with my closing. Yes, yes. What an insightful webinar, a well-spent afternoon indeed. Uh, the webinar was third in the series, Women in Tech, an initiative of She at Sikki, bringing together an ecosystem of partners and speakers to inspire us to pledge our commitment to inclusive AI. Today, we focused on empowering women in AI to redress women's status in society and contribute to a better world for all. Our Sikki membership is open to companies and individuals. To find out more, please call us or write to us at the email found in the chat. Once again, we would like to thank everyone who participated in today's webinar. And we would like to thank our speakers once again. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. you everybody. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, ladies. All of you. Amazing. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you.